uh, the last lecture in the Rade Magna series by Jacob Lurie, and it's on the proof of the vague conjecture for function fields. All right, thank you very much. So uh, let me recall what we ended with in the previous lecture. So uh, let x be a curve over, and now it's going to be an algebraically closed field. going to be some smooth affine scheme over x. And the, you can contemplate what I'm going to talk about for any smooth affine group scheme, but in order to prove the theorems that I'm going to describe, you're going to need some hypotheses on G. So the hypotheses um, specifically are that this has connected fibers. Generic fiber is semi simple and simply connected. And then, whenever you have such a thing, you can consider the moduli stack of G bundles on X. So, this is an algebraic stack, and in particular, you can extract. Uh, Invariance using the theory of a tall and L-adic cohomology. So let's say the goal is to um, compute, or maybe to describe, to say something about the L-adic cohomology of this. which is not equal to zero. So what I would like to do in the first part of this lecture is um, to meet this goal, to say something about uh, how to control the L-adic cohomology of bun GX. And the second goal is to uh, explain how this makes sense when k is the algebraic closure of a finite field, and all the data is actually defined over that finite field. This is when x and g are defined over some fq. And recall there's a particular statement about the cohomology of Bungie that we wanted to prove. Um, specifically, what we want is to prove uh, Bayes conjecture in its cohomological formulation, which in the previous lecture I said was that if you take the trace of the inverse of Frobenius on the cohomology of bon G, that this is something that has a particular Euler product extension. Namely, it's a product of the closed points of the curve. This now, I'm, I'm thinking of the curve as defined over a finite field now. Of um, well, let me just write it in the pedestrian way that I wrote it before. The size of the residue field raised to the power given by the dimension of G divided by um, the size of the finite group that you get by evaluating G on the residue field. And I'm not going to get to this statement in, in this talk. But I want to actually get to a, just a vaguer form of this statement, which is that uh, I would like to s explain why, the when you try to compute this trace, it's something that has an Euler product expansion at all. So I'm going to give you a sketch that the left-hand side is something that you should be able to write as a product over the points of x of some local pieces. And I'm not going to explain why the local pieces uh, should look like this. But let's 
start with the first goal. So the first goal is something that makes sense over any field. And in particular, it makes sense over the field of complex numbers. So as I indicated at the end last time, when you're over the complex numbers, this is essentially a topological problem. So when uh, k is equal to c, and uh, let's say g is constant, then you can take the cohomology of bungee x thought of in terms of L-adic cohomology. So this is a sort of algebra geometric invariant. But you can identify this with the cohomology of a topological space. Namely, the topological space of mapped from x, where you think of x as a compact Riemann surface, into Bg, where you think of Bg as a uh, this BG has the meaning that it has in topology. It's what you get when you take a contractible space with a free action of G and divide out. Um, sorry, in this brackets, I meant the space of all maps. And this sort of mapping space is something that we described in the second lecture. So recall that um, in the second lecture, we have this non-abelian Poincaré duality statement, which says that you can write the space of maps from x into bg. You can build a model for it. That's what's called the homotopy co-limit over u of compactly supported maps from u into bg, where u ranges over disjoint unions of open disks. So here we're talking about a manifold of dimension 2. So I would allow you to range over open sets that look like a disjoint union of finitely many two disks. So this is a description of this mapping space, which makes sense in topology. Now the right-hand side here doesn't immediately translate to something in algebraic geometry. Right? In algebraic geometry, uh, we don't have immediate analogs of things like open disks in the complex analytic topology. Which was, uh, disks inside a Riemann surface will be analytic open su sets that are almost never going to be Zariski open. So the question that we could ask is, can we make some analog of this in algebraic geometry? So let me start by uh, giving you a heuristic description of what this statement is saying here. So a map from x into bg, you should think of as like the data of a g-bundle on x. And what this saying that, that uh, the map is supported or has compact support in some open set u is like saying you specify a g-bundle on x, and you trivialize it outside a compact subset of u. And if u is a disk, or a finite collection of disks, that's more or less the same thing as saying that you want to trivialize your bundle away from a finite set of points, namely points which are the middle of each of these disks. So, that's, so this uh, statement is saying that if you want to understand the homotopy type of the space of all g-bundles on x, it suffices, in some sense, to think about g-bundles which are supported at finitely many points, meaning they're trivialized away from finitely many points or away from small neighborhood of finitely many points or something like that. And uh, as long as you allow the points to sort of vary, and that's what's going on when you take a homotopy co-limit, you're sort of allowing the points to move around and to collide with each other and so forth. As long as you let the points move around, you, you'll get a good model for the homotopy type of all G-bundles. And what I would like to do is to just take that heuristic that I just described and make that into a literal definition in the setting of algebraic geometry. So, um, so the answer to this is going to be yes, and here's how. So I'm going to define something that I'm going to call Ron G of X. So first, let me describe what this 
let me define ron g of x as a set. So ron g of x is going to be the set of all um, triples <coughs> consisting of s, p, and alpha, where s contained in x is a uh, non-empty finite set. <coughs> p is a g-bundle on x. And alpha is a trivialization of P away from the set S. And here, to make this into a set, I really need to take isomorphism classes of this. But this is an innocuous thing to do, because let me just observe that any automorphism of a G bundle, which preserves a trivialization outside a finite set, is forced to be the identity. So uh, when there are isomorphisms between triples like this, the isomorphisms are unique. So this is what you might call the, the set of all G bundles that are, have been trivialized away from a finite collection of points. And the first thing that I want to do is to observe that this set has some additional structure. So it's not an algebraic variety. It's sort of an infinite dimensional object, right? Like if you ignore the p and the alpha even, you're talking about non-empty finite subsets of x. Of course, that, that feels like something that looks like uh, it's bigger than x, and it's bigger than x squared, and it's bigger than x cubed. It contains the collection of non-empty finite subsets of cardinality n for every n, and the dimensions of those spaces are going up and up. So, this thing isn't an algebraic variety. It's sort of an infinite dimensional thing. But it nonetheless makes sense to, um, to contemplate it as having a kind of geometric structure. So let me tell you how to make that idea precise. And the point is just that uh, here I told you what the points of Ron GX are. And this definition of points uh, generalizes to talking about R-valued points, where R is any KF. So let's say more generally, if Y is, a, um, is any say, K scheme, I'm going to define um, what I'm going to call the set of maps from y into ron gx. And this is just going to be the obvious generalization of this if I wanted to talk not about um, a single point, but a family of points parameterized by y. So this is going to be the set of all triples s, uh, p, comma, alpha, where s is a finite, is a non-empty finite set of maps from y to x. Um, <coughs> P is a g-bundle on x cross y. And alpha is a trivialization of P restricted to the open subset of x cross y that you get by removing the images of the graphs, let's say minus the graphs of elements of s. Now, if here's a picture of x cross y, each of these uh, maps that belong to the set s can be thought of as giving you a subset of x cross y. By writing down its graph, you take the union of all these graphs and you remove it. And alpha is a trivialization. And as before, I'm going to really say up to isomorphism, but that's a mild thing to say because isomorphisms, when they exist, are unique. OK, so this ron gx, so this is now a definition of what it means to give a map into ron gx. 
And what sort of object is ROM GX? It's just a pre-sheaf. It's a pre-sheaf on the category of schemes. In other words, I'm saying nothing more about it than that I've specified what it means to give a map into ROM GX. In particular, it's not a pre-sheaf, which is uh, it's not a sheaf for most topologies that you might want to think about. It's not representable by a variety or a stack or anything like this. I just want to think about that as a functor of Y. But I want to observe that there's a natural map from Ron GX to Bun GX. Remember, Bun GX an algebraic stack. It's a little bit of a better object, but it's defined in the same kind of a way. To define bun GX, you say what it means to give a map from Y into bun GX, and it's just the second of those three pieces of data, a G bundle on X cross Y. So this construction would take a triple S comma P comma alpha and just assign to it the underlying G bundle where you forget the points of X and you forget the uh, trivialization. And so what this ROM GX is supposed to be is some algebra geometric incarnation of that heuristic that I described to you earlier. It's supposed to be an object which captures G bundles equipped with a trivialization away from a finite set. And now even though this thing is not um, an algebraic variety, it still makes sense to contemplate uh, certain homological invariance. So you can make sense of things like the L-adic cohomology of this pre-sheaf. And to can prove the following theorem, which is a version of non-abelian Poincaré duality, but now in the setting of algebraic geometry. So the non-abelian Poincaré duality says the following. Um, if you look at this map from Ron GX to Bun GX, is uh, induces an isomorphism on L-adic cohomology. So it's something that behaves kind of like a homotopy equivalence, or at least a homology isomorphism. Um, and this is it's capturing something like the content of non-abelian Poincaré duality and topology, which said that uh, some mapping space had a model consisting of things built out of thinking about finitely many points at a time. OK, so this is sort of the, the place where our approach to Bayes conjecture gets started. And I want to give a little bit of a sketch of what you do to prove this theorem. I'm not going to be very precise. But I'll be accurate in the sense that uh, you really do take the vague ideas that I'm going to explain and make them precise in order to give a real proof. So the first idea is that this happens fiberwise. In other words, it's not just a statement about this map um, being globally some kind of isomorphism on cohomology, it's because the cohomology of each fiber of the map is trivial. So uh, let's fix. So let's look at this map from Ron GX to Bun GX. And now let's fix a point of Bun GX, meaning you fix a G bundle. Then I want to study the fiber over this point, which means from now on the bundle is fixed, and you get what I'm going to call rational sections of the point. So this is um, like a space which parametrizes uh, trivializations of P defined away from a finite subset. And now I just want to explain 
how this works in one example. G is GLN. So GLN doesn't satisfy the hypothesis that I made at the beginning, that uh, it's not generically semi-simple. Something like SLN would be semi-simple. Uh, but you don't need the semi-simplicity for this phase of the argument. So this non-abelian Poincaré duality statement works for GLN too, and it's probably easiest to see what's going on in the example of GLN. So if G is GLN, then we can understand what a GLN bundle is on X pretty simply. That's just a vector bundle of rank N. So P is equal to some vector bundle E rank N. And now I'm going to sort of give a heuristic description of what these rational sections are. Um, so this bundle, if you look at this bundle E, it has a generic, it has a fiber at the generic point. So this, I'll write it as E sub beta, this is an n-dimensional vector space. Over the function field of the curve, which I'll write as K sub x. And this space is like the space of rational trivializations of this bundle. It's like the space of all choices of basis for this vector space. Right? If you give me n elements of E eta, well, that gives me a bunch of global sections of E, which are possibly defined away from a finite set of points. And if those n elements form a basis for E eta, then those sections give me a trivialization of the vector bundle E outside of possibly slightly larger finite set of points. So this sec that P, I'll just sort of write in quotation marks, this is the space of all bases. And the kind of thing that we want to prove is that this space of all bases is contractible, or it, it has a, the, the same cohomology as a point. And that's a little hard to think about if you're thinking about these infinite dimensional vector spaces. So what I would like to do is make some finite dimensional approximations to this uh, space of rational sections. So let's fix a divisor. An effective divisor D contained in the curve X. And then we can contemplate what happens if I don't look at the space of all rational sections of the vector bundle E, I look at the space of sections that are only allowed to have poles along the divisor D. So I can contemplate um, what in the notation of algebraic geometry is the global sections of X with coefficients in E twisted by D. Sections that are allowed a pole of order D. Now any n-tuple of sections here in particular, will give me an n-tuple of uh, elements at the generic point. And I can contemplate whether or not they give me one of these rational trivializations. But that doesn't always happen, right? If I give you an n-tuple of sections, maybe one of them is zero. That would be bad. That would then not give me a basis for E at the generic point. So if you want to detect what's going on, whether or not you're getting something at the generic point, um, what you can do is take these n sections and uh, you know, sort of take the determinant. So given these n sections, you can produce a global section of the nth exterior power of E. And then if each of your sections possibly had some poles along D, then when you wedge them together, maybe you get some bigger poles along D. There's the top exterior power of E is some line bundle on the algebraic curve X. And by wedging these sections together, you get a section of this line bundle. And now um, a point of, or let's say an element, um, F1, let's call it S1 dot 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 Sn in here gives a rational trivialization. If and only 
with, when I think of S1 wedge dot 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 wedge Sn as a section of this line bundle, that that section is not zero. So what I'm doing here is, is building a sort of finite dimensional approximation to the space of all rational sections. If you look at this vector space, the collection of uh, n tuples of sections of E with poles along D, this forms now a finite dimensional vector space over the ground field K. And in fact, if the divisor D is big enough, you could say exactly how big that finite dimensional vector space is using the Riemann rock. So this is some finite dimensional affine space. And similarly, this is some finite dimensional affine space. And let's actually compute what the dimension of this space is. So if my divisor D is sufficiently large, Riemann-Roch theorem will tell me exactly how big this vector space is. Riemann Rock says that the dimension is uh, 1 minus the genus of x plus the degree of the line bundle E plus n times uh, the degree of the divisor D. OK, so here's this vector space. We know its dimension. And inside this vector space, we have the entire vector space minus the origin. And that has some inverse image under this nonlinear map, which is an open subset of this big vector space here. Now, what you would expect in this situation, um, so let's say expectation. is that u is the complement of a uh, subvariety whose codimension is exactly this number here. 1 minus the genus of x plus the degree, whatever this vector bundle e is, plus n times the degree of the divisor. It's not so important exactly what this number is. There's only one thing that's important about it. It's that when d gets bigger, this number goes up. Okay, so if you take an affine space and remove a subset of large codimension, then what's left is a highly connected space. It's, when you write compute its cohomology, you find that its cohomology is the same as the cohomology of, of a point through a range of degrees up to about this uh, twice whatever this codimension is. So this u will actually uh, be highly connected. And the bigger the divisor d is, the more connected u will be. And now what you actually want to do is not fix a divisor d at all, but consider all the rational sections of p. And that's, roughly speaking, what you get when you take a direct limit as the divisor d gets bigger and bigger. As the divisor d gets bigger and bigger, these things um, have vanishing cohomology in more and more degrees. And in the limit, this thing is actually acyclic. It has vanishing cohomology in all degrees except for degree 0. And that's, uh, that's roughly speaking, why this map from Ron gx to Bun gx gives you an isomorphism on cohomology. So, so this is actually stronger. I mean, it also will say that the Evadi homotopy type of this. Yeah, I think you could refine it to a, well, sorry, no, I mean, if, you, if Evadi homotopy type means something about um, equivalence, uh, you know, every uh, local system right. upstairs descends to a local system downstairs, then I don't think this is proving that. It doesn't. That um, doesn't. But that probably, no, sorry, you probably could prove that too. That sounds right, but let me... Okay, okay so... 
But we want to close the case. I want to say we've now met the first goal. And now I want to tell you why this is a useful statement. So now let me assume that everything is defined over some finite field. What's the object on the bottom right? Sorry? In the diagram above your head. Yeah. What's the object on the bottom right? The bottom right is just a sing I Come fix on. a G bundle. Yeah. I mean that, that means spec K, I guess. But snapping by that choice of G bundle. So let's assume that everything is defined over some finite field FQ. And what I would like to actually do is say something. So our goal is, let's say, to compute trace of the inverse of Frobenius on the cohomology of the X. Okay, so the first observation is exactly what I just said is I get to replace bun GX by ron GX here. So this is the same as the trace of Frobenius inverse on the cohomology of this object that I'm calling ron GX. So why is this an improvement? So what I would actually like to do is contemplate correspondence. So this wrong GX is something that maps to bun GX. And it also maps to what I'm just going to call Ron X. So Ron X means um, if you took my definition of Ron GX and just made G the trivial group means what you would get if you did that construction. So the points here are just non-empty finite subsets of x. And you don't have to specify a g-bundle or a trivialization or anything. And there's an obvious map from uh, the middle to the left, which takes a triple s comma p comma alpha and forgets everything except s. So let me call this map pi. It's going to be a everything else I'm going to say in this lecture. So the rest of this lecture, I'm going to need to, uh, to assume that people have some uh, comfort with the notion of derived categories of L-adic sheaves. Um, and maybe it's unreasonable to assume that you're comfortable with that on objects like Ron X and Ron GX, which are not algebraic varieties. But uh, let's pretend that uh, these things are sensible. And one of the things that you have to do to prove the theorem is to make them sensible. But so the idea is you want to compute the cohomology of Bun GX by this non boolean cooperativity. That's the same thing as the cohomology of Ron GX. And I want to identify that with the cohomology of the wrong space of X, but with local coefficients, or not local, with, with coefficients in a certain sheaf. And that sheaf is what you would write as r pi lower star of the constant sheaf. If I think of, if I take the constant sheaf on Ron GX and just push it forward along the map pi, I get some sheaf on the wrong space. So I'd like to say a little bit about what this object looks like. First, let me give it a name. I'm going to call it A. So let's uh, get a sense of how A looks. So let's say something about the fibers of pi. So what do the fibers of pi look like? So what happens if you fix a point of the Ron space, Ron x, corresponding to a non-empty finite subset S. And you take its inverse image. What you get is an object that you can think of as parametrizing G bundles P plus a trivialization of P restricted to X. So let me draw a picture 
So you have your entire curve x, and then you have maybe finitely many points of your curve um, that belong to this finite set s. And you're trying to understand uh, the classification of G bundles that are equipped with a trivialization outside of this finite set. Now recall that any G bundle can also be trivialized in a formal disk around every point. So given a G bundle, you could also choose trivializations on small disks around these points. But those trivializations will probably not agree with the trivialization that you have away from those three points. You can measure the failure of them to agree. They're going to disagree by the action of some element of G evaluated on the local fields at these points. So choosing trivializations near the points of S gives an element of the product over all the elements of S of G evaluated on Kx. So recall Kx means the fraction field of the completed local ring at the point X. Now, of course, these elements that you get will depend on the choices that you made to trivialize the bundles on these disks. <coughs> so you actually get something that's ambiguous up to multiplication by elements of the product over x and s of g and o, o, o x. And this is exactly how you describe the structure of a a G bundle trivialized away from these finite set of points, this fiber can be identified with the product of finitely many factors parametrized by the elements of S of uh, the quotient G of Kx divided by G of Ox. So this object has a name, what's sometimes called the affine Grassmannian of the group G. So the fibers of pi, the fiber of pi over an n element set, looks like a product of n copies of this affine Grassmann. And let me just tell you a few things about this affine Grassmann. So the objects that I'm writing down now, things like the Ron space and Ron GX, are pretty far from being algebraic varieties. But these affine Grassmannians are, are much closer. They're infinite dimensional, but you remark that GER G uh, can be realized. As a direct limit of projective varieties. and a direct limit of a, a sequence of them under closed embeddings. So y0 embedded in y1, embedded in y2, and so forth. Let me remark that uh, to make this statement, I'm going to assume for the rest of this lecture that G is uh, assuming that all fibers of G are semi-simple. address the general case, but it's a little easier to see what's going on under this assumption. So uh, this is sort of an infinite dimensional object, but it's infinite dimensional in a very specific way. It's just because you take something, it's something that looks like uh, an infinite dimensional projective space, like a union of finite dimensional projective spaces. It's n goes to infinity. Um, So this is a statement about what the fiber of this map looks like over a single point of the Ron space. It looks like something that you can think of as in some sense as being compact. And in fact, uh, you can elaborate on that and get a version of that statement that's true in families. And so let me return to this. So let's say using this, you can show that this map pi from Ron G of x to Ron space of x is uh, a 
actually I want to say proper, but maybe it's more accurate to say this is improper. And what that means for what I want to say next is that I can treat this as a proper map for purposes of working with sheaves. So in, in this situation, you have a proper base change theorem. Which you can apply. Remember, this sheaf A was defined by taking the direct image of the constant sheaf on Ron GX. And what I'm saying is that if you took A and you wanted to compute its stock at a point of the Ron space, well, this is something that you can describe as, um, well, this A is really a complex of sheaves. So why don't I say you can take the cohomology of this stock. And what you get is the cohomology of this, uh, of this fiber, pi inverse of s. And this description of that, together with the Kunin formula, tells you that it looks like some kind of tensor product indexed by the elements of the finite set s of a bunch of copies of the cohomology of the affine Grassmann. So this A is an example of what's called a factorizable sheaf. So it's a sheaf on the Ron space, meaning it has a stock at every finite. I can talk about its stock at any point corresponding to a finite subset of the curve. And its stock at a finite set S is a tensor product of factors that, do, uh, that come from the individual points, come from the individual elements of S. Ron is not an in scheme because, uh, I mean, it's something you can write as a direct limit of schemes, but it's not a filtered direct limit. It's like indexed by the category of finite sets. Uh, So what do we want to do with this? We want, to, we want to say something about the cohomology of A and take some kind of trace of Frobenius on it. And here we have A, and we have a description of its stocks. So let me remind you of uh, what kind of thing that you might try to do if we were not dealing with the Ron space, but we were dealing with some kind of finite dimensional algebraic variety. So let's see the finite dimensional variety over that Q. And I want to remind you what the broken deep left shuts trace formula says, but now not the constant sheaf case, but the, the case with coefficients in some non-constant L-adic sheaf. So let F be an L-adic sheaf. says the following. If you want to take the trace of uh, Frobenius on the uh, cohomology of Z, and let me put a bar over it to mean your base change to the algebraic closure of FQ with coefficients in F. But this is given by a sum indexed by the points find over the finite field FQ of the trace of Probanius on the uh, stock of F at the point. I'm sorry, this is compactly supported cohomology. So this statement, when you take F to be the constant sheaf, is exactly the growth and deep left shift trace formula in the incarnation that I described in the previous lecture, which tells you that you can compute the uh, number of points as the trace of Frobenius on some compactly supported cohomology. 
So this is kind of like the thing that we want to do, but not quite, because in our situation, what we really want to study is not the compactly supported cohomology of A, but the cohomology of A. And we want to take the trace, not of Frobenius, but of the inverse of Frobenius. So you can do that at the cost of uh, passing to Verdier duality everywhere. So there's a, a Verdier dual statement. Where you just replace everything in this uh, statement by an appropriate dual. So instead of meeting the trace of Frobenius, you meet the trace of the inverse of Frobenius. Instead of compactly supported cohomology, you meet non compactly supported cohomology. And that's a sum over these FQ points of the trace of the inverse of Frobenius. But now what you meet is not. Uh, the stalks of F at the different points, but what are called the co-stalks, the Verdier duals of the stalks. Uh, so these, these objects are computing the local cohomology of the sheaf F at the finitely many FQ value points. So roughly speaking, we would like to apply this Verdier dual formula in, uh, in our situation where we take z to be the wrong space of the curve. So let me uh, now emphasize that what I'm about to say is a heuristic. Underline it twice. So a heuristic would be, well, if you wanted to take the trace for Benius inverse, on the cohomology of bungee x. That should be like the trace of the radius inverse on the cohomology of the bond space. The coefficients in this uh, sheet that I'm calling A. And you would expect that you could write this as a sum over all the FQ value points of the Ron space, which are like finite sets of closed points of the curve, um, something that you get by taking the co-stalk of A at the corresponding point of the Ron space. I'm sorry, you should take a trace of some inverse Frobenius on this. But now, this A has this factorization property. The behavior of A at the point S, uh, it looks like a tensor product indexed by S. So you might expect that what you get here is something that you can write as a sum over S contained in X. I'm sorry, I should emphasize here, S is not allowed to be the empty set. S is not allowed to be the empty set. And what you should have is a product over the elements of S of some kind of trace of some inverse Frobenius on the co-stalk of A defined at a point of the wrong space corresponding to an individual point of the curve. So this here is a sum of products of a particular form that looks like you should be able to apply some kind of distributive law and rewrite it as a product of sums. So let me do that up here. So roughly speaking, what this ought to be is some kind of product over all the closed points of x of something like 1 plus the trace of phi x inverse on this closed point. And well, except that would be, that's what it should look like if we included the empty set. Since we didn't include the empty set, we should subtract one at the end. OK, so this is a heuristic calculation. But let me just emphasize, this heuristic is bad. So you can sort of make sense of, you can make sense of what's on the left-hand side. You can also make sense of what's on the right-hand side. And if you go to the trouble of making sense of what's on the right-hand side, you'll find that it's zero. 
So something's wrong with this. This doesn't quite work. And what's wrong with this is that we tried to apply some Verdier dual form of the growth in deep left shed's trace formula, but not to a finite dimensional algebraic variety, but to this infinite dimensional object, which is the Ron space. So if you want to have some kind of Verdier duality on the Ron space, you have to be careful. You don't want to deal with sort of sheaves that are supported on the entire space. So things like uh, the constant sheaf on the Ron space is a very bad object applying Verdier duality to. Uh, what you can apply Verdier duality to are sheaves that are supported on, in some sense, a finite dimensional part of the Ron space. Or we're really talking about uh, complexes of sheaves here. Complexes whose cohomologies, uh, where each individual cohomology group is supported on some finite dimensional version of the Ron space. So remember, what the sheaf A looks like. The sheaf A is such that its stock on the finite set S this is some complex whose cohomology looks like a tensor product over the elements of S of the cohomology of this affine Grassmannian. So this is a very bad kind of sheaf because in degree zero, what you're seeing is the constant sheaf. Each one of these copies of the affine Grassmannian has a one-dimensional H zero. But there's a variant which is better behaved. So I'm not going to define it for you. But let's say there exists a variant which I'll call A reduced. And it has the following feature that when you take the cohomology of A reduced, the stock at the point S, that it's a tensor product over the points of S of the reduced cohomologies. And this is a much more uh, legitimate object as far as Verdier duality is concerned. Because if you look at these cohomology groups, they're going to vanish through a range of degrees that depends on how big this finite set S is. Now, this sheaf A was important to us because remember the cohomology of bungee X was the same as the cohomology of the Ron space or sorry, the cohomology just of Ron X with coefficients in the sheet A. And there's a variant of this statement for this reduced version. If you take the reduced cohomology of bungee X, then what you get is um, the cohomology of Ron X with coefficients in A reduced. So now let me correct this bad heuristic and give you a good heuristic. So a good heuristic is what you get when you do the same thing, but you take the reduced version of every object. So the cohomology of reduced cohomology of bun GX is the cohomology of A reduced, which is given by a formula like this. And then this has some kind of a, a product decomposition, which gives you this Euler product decomposition where you here use A reduced. Now, you sort of subtracted one on both sides. So let me just rewrite that for you when you add one to both sides. And the formula that you get is that the trace of Frobenius inverse on the entire cohomology of bun GX um, looks like a product over the closed points of x of some local pieces. And those local pieces are, uh, let's say, 1 plus the trace of some local Frobenius on some complex that you get by taking the local cohomology of A reduced at this point. So this is what I told you at the beginning that I was going to get in this lecture. I'm going to explain that uh, this trace of Frobenius on the cohomology of the moduli stack of G bundles is, should have some kind of an Euler product decomposition. It should be something that you can write as a product of local factors. Now, if you want to get from here to a proof of a Bayes conjecture, you need to figure out what these local factors are. 
need to actually identify this. think about the entire algebraic curve x. It only requires you to think about what's going on in a small neighborhood of every point of x. And let me just tell you, um, let me tell you what else you have to do in order to prove phase conjecture, or what you have to identify these local cohomology, uh, these cosinoffs with. You take the cosinoff of a reduced at a point x, what you're supposed to see there is the reduced cohomology of uh, PG at the point X. And if you do this local calculation, what you get is the uh, product decomposition in the form that I described it to you at the end of the last lecture. All right, so ah, just perfect timing. I will stop there. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about why passing to the reduced sheet fixed the problem? I missed like why it made the merger well. I mean, don't think I can explain that okay. in one sentence. Okay. I mean, you. A one sentence version is Verdier duality works on finite dimensional spaces. If you want to sort of extrapolate from finite dimensional spaces to infinite dimensional spaces, <coughs> you run into some trouble unless you deal with sheaves that are sort of live just on finite dimensional loci. Yeah, I guess I didn't see why it lived on the finite dimensional loci. Ah, okay. So well, that was the question. So what happens when you take um, the cohomology? this A reduced, and you take it stock at a point S. And well, the only thing I told you about this A reduced is what this was. This is something that looks like, like a tensor product over the elements of S of the reduced cohomologies of these affine Grossmannites. And now, um, when you take these affine Grossmannites are connected. And so when you take the reduced cohomology, there's nothing in degree 0. In fact, there's also nothing in degree 1. These things start in degree 2. So when you take a tensor product, let's say S has n elements, and you take a tensor product of these things, you get uh, a complex which, whose cohomologies are concentrated in degrees 2n and above. And so if you're interested um, in a particular cohomological degree, uh, 5, then you're not going to have any contributions from when the set S has cardinality 3 or more. Other questions? So the statement that you just erased, <laughs> uh, 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 that said that you get the reduced cohomology of BGX, is that under the assumption that GX is semi-simple, or are you allowing uh, so your original hypothesis? Yeah, that doesn't need semi-simplicity, I believe. Uh, I mean, you, you, sorry, you're, what you do need is that you're generically simply connected for, for that statement. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the original assumption we keep, that we are yeah. generically simply connected and semi-simple, yeah, and I, connected I, everywhere, but. Yeah, I think that that is correct at all points, even when you have that reduction. I mean, what won't be true is that uh, this description of the stocks will be bad. Um, and the points of that. Right, because that depends on some kind of proper base change. So, I mean, you can get that to be true of bad points if you choose the parahoric model for your group scheme. Mm -hmm. But it's more convenient to choose really bad models, in which case this, this statement would not be correct. Other questions? Again. So we will be going out to dinner, and if you want to join, you should tell me now. <laughs>